A reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The Lord called to Samuel, who answered, Here I am. Samuel ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. I did not call you, Eli said. Go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Again the Lord called Samuel, who rose and went to Eli. Here I am, he said. You called me. But Eli answered, I did not call you, my son. Go back to sleep. At that time, Samuel was not familiar with the Lord, because the Lord had not revealed anything to him as yet. The Lord called Samuel again for the third time. Getting up and going to Eli, he said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So he said to Samuel, Go to sleep, and if you are called, reply, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When Samuel went to sleep in his place, the Lord came and revealed his presence, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not permitting any word of his to be without effect. The word of the Lord. sacrifice and offerings, but in an open You do not ask for holocaust and victim. Then I said, see, I have stands written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your instruction lies deep within.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? But whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Avoid immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been purchased at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Dominus Fabiscum, et Lexus Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. John was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they went and saw Jesus where Jesus was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas which is translated Peter. Verbum Domini. (laughs) 
this past fall, there were two teenagers who were beatified by the church. The first was October 10th, Blessed Carlo Acutis, who I've talked about before. He called the Eucharist his highway to heaven. And computer genius that he was, he created an international display of Eucharistic miracles. And the one I want to speak about today was beatified on November 7th in Barcelona, in Spain. And his name is Joan Roj Digo. So he lived during the time of the Spanish Civil War when there's a great hatred against the church. He was born on May 12, 1917, the very day before the first apparition at Fatima in Portugal. And it was as a teenager that he helped support his own family that was having financial difficulties, working as a clerk, working in a factory. But he also joined a group of young people. They were called the youth, the Christian youth of Catalonia, that area of Spain. There were some 8,000 members before the Spanish War began. And some 300 of those youth would be martyred during the Spanish Civil War. So Blessed Joan Rige, Roj, Joan Roj, had a great devotion to the Eucharist like Blessed Carlo Acutis. And he would be lost sometimes in adoration. And those who knew him said that he converted more by his example than by his words. But he also was known for, as his mother said, for his works of charity to those who were suffering. Well, because the churches were being closed, burnt down, or destroyed by what was going on and the hatred against the faith at that time in Spain, the priest entrusted a ciborium of consecrated hosts to blessed Joan Roge. He knew that this was a dangerous thing for him to be entrusted with. But the priest wanted that the people would not be deprived of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And he instructed them to bring the Holy Eucharist to their homes, to bring them Holy Communion. And he said to his family one time that he knew that the militiamen were out to kill him. But he said, I fear nothing. I take the master with me. So he had a sense of the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. I fear nothing. I take the master with me. And indeed, one day they did come to his house and fearing that they would desecrate the Eucharist, he immediately consumed the Blessed Sacrament in the Saborium. He gave his mother a hug, and she, he said to her, <clears throat> God is with me. So the militiamen, militiamen took him out to the cemetery where he was martyred. <clears throat> he was shot some five times. And as he was going to be uh, executed, he said to those who were about to pull the trigger on the gun to execute him, may God forgive you as I forgive you. And as they shot him, he said, long live Christ the King. So these courageous examples of young people <clears throat> We can think, as I said, some 300 in that youth movement at the time were martyrs. Some 8,000 people were martyred for their faith in Spain at that time in 1936. <clears throat> and we see in today's first reading from the first book of Samuel that young people are called like Samuel was. Young Samuel, you know, he was brought to the temple he was, his mother Hannah was so grateful that God had intervened. She had been childless and now she had this child 
and she brought him to the temple to serve the Lord at a young age. But he spent some time there, and we read that he grew in stature and favor before God and men. And Josephus, the Jewish historian of the time of Jesus, says that Samuel was 12 years old at the time he first hears the Lord's voice. Well, think of Jesus being found in the temple at the age of 12, who likewise says, I'm about my father's, I'm in my father's house doing his work. He grew in stature also in favor before God and men. So this we see in Samuel, 12 years old, and we heard Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So young people, whatever, or whatever age we are, we are to listen for the Lord's voice. And it's a beautiful uh, sentence that we all can say, especially when we're reading the scriptures or we come to mass. There's a word the Lord wants to say to you or through the televised mass. There's a, a word the Lord wants to say to you and especially if we have that heart like young Samuel that Eli taught him, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I want to hear your word and not only hear it, but I want to follow it. I want to observe it. Help me to know your word. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And when I'm listening, that means that I'm attentive to that. And I want to respond to what I hear. And I want to follow in that way that you have charted out for me, that you want for me. Because I know you only want what is good for me. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And maybe when we're reading the scriptures or we're at mass, then we conclude that mass or that reading of the scriptures with the words of Mary. Let it be done to me according to your word. Two beautiful phrases that we can take from the scriptures and our own listening to the Lord, wanting to hear his voice, reading the scriptures, attending the mass whenever we pray, but then wanting to carry it out. Let it be done to me according to your word. So we see that Samuel, where was Samuel sleeping? He was sleeping where the ark of God was. He was in the temple. And so the ark was a place of God's special presence. And that's where Samuel was. And he hears him in the tabernacle. Another word for the place where the ark was, the tabernacle. Well, we likewise, we will especially hear the Lord where he is profoundly present in the tabernacle in our churches. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Let it be done to me according to your word. And so today's Psalm, Psalm 40, you know, when we friars enter the novitiate, we receive the habit. This is the Psalm of that novitiate ceremony, Psalm 40. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Whatever age we are, we can say that every day. Here I am, Lord, this day is something new. Your grace is always fresh. I may be getting older or I may be young, but Lord, here I am, I come to do your will. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Let it be done to me according to your word. The psalm says, to do your will, O God, is my delight. Yes, blessed indeed is the one who follows the will of the Lord. His life is indeed blessed, as the scriptures relate again and again. And so the gospel today from the gospel of John, we're reading through the gospel of Mark during this year, but Mark's a short gospel. It's just 16 chapters. So we have a couple smatterings of John in here, and here's where we have uh, the Gospel of John today, and then this summer, the Bread of Life Discourse of John we will have for several Sundays. But in John's Gospel, 
we see that God is speaking now to these two disciples. And John recognizes who Jesus is. And so he says, behold the Lamb of God. And so they follow him. And here's an important question that Jesus asked them, that he asked each of us, that maybe we're asking in our own lives. Jesus says, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? What is it that you want? Sometimes we don't even know. We can't really put words on it. We just have this sense we need something. There's something missing. There's something lacking. And how do the disciples answer? Where are you staying? In other words, they could recognize in him that this was the answer to what they were looking for. It was him. Master, teacher, rabbi, where are you staying? And they stayed with them the whole day. John never forgot that. And he wrote, it was four in the afternoon. So it's in him that we find what we're looking for, the deepest desires, what we sense in ourselves that's lacking, that needs something to fill that emptiness, that void. What are you looking for? Where are you staying, Lord? And I think the main point that I wanted to make, especially today, is that we have that same question, but that also that the Lord is in our midst in a very profound way, a very powerful way, that he remains with us in the Blessed Sacrament. And even young people like Carlo Acutis and Joan Roche, that these young men recognize that. The Eucharist is my highway to heaven, Carlo Acutis said. Joan Roche would spend time before the Blessed Sacrament. He'd be lost in that time of adoration. The priest knew of his devotion, and so he entrusted him with the care of the Blessed Sacrament so that those who weren't able to receive because of the closing of the churches could still receive. And indeed, that was proved at the end of his life as he protected the Blessed Sacrament from being desecrated. And he was strengthened by that Eucharistic bread, by the Lord's presence, to be able to proclaim as the last thing of his life the words that Jesus said, I forgive you. Long live Christ the King. So we are not orphans, we're not alone. The world has troubles, and yet we have a place where we can turn. We have a refuge right here, wherever the Blessed Sacrament is. Master, where are you staying? Here. And they stayed with him all day. We can go to our churches and we can stay with the Lord. We can watch with him for one hour. And he will always pick us up. He will always renew us. He'll always give us light for the journey. He'll give us courage in the challenging days that we face, perhaps face. I came across a quite remarkable quote of Karol Wojtyla two years before he was elected to the papacy Cardinal Carol Wojtyla, later to become Pope St. John Paul II, he talked in Philadelphia, in the United States of America. And he said these remarkable words. And this is, you can find this on the, the Vatican Library, Libreria Eretrice Vaticana. And here's what he had to say. I think they're important words for us to have courage like the blessed Joan that I spoke of today. He said, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. 
I do not think that wide circles of American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church of the gospel versus the anti-gospel. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is a trial which the whole church must take up. It is a trial of not only the church, but in a sense, a test of 2,000 years of culture and Christian civilization with all of its consequences for human dignity, individual rights, human rights, and the rights of nations. We must, prepare, must be prepared to undergo great trials in the not too distant future. Trials that will require us to be ready to give up even our lives and a total gift of self to Christ and for Christ. Through your prayers and mine, it is possible to alleviate this tribulation, but it is no longer possible to avert it. How many times has a renewal of the church been brought about in blood? It will not be different this time. Sobering words. And we know that the 20th century was the century of the most martyrs in history. We know that today some 300 million Christians in the world are suffering persecution. Some of them reached perhaps through EWTN, and I encourage you. But we need that courage, but also that hope alive in our heart. Whatever may come, whatever challenges that may come, what does blessed Joan teach us? That we're going to find strength in Christ. We're going to find strength in the Eucharist. That he will not abandon us, that whatever may come, he will give us the grace we need at that time in that moment. We don't have that grace for tomorrow today. We have the graces that we need for today, today, and each moment. His grace is always fresh, it's always new. It's always there to support us. He never abandons us, he never forsakes us. He's always faithful to us. And whatever he may ask of us, he will give us the grace sufficient to do it, to live it. And we can always have hope and heart because we know the end of the story is glory. That blessed Joan Roge now enjoys the glory of heaven after the fury of this earth, that he now is faithful to the Lord and to the end, and now he rests in his heart forever in glory. May he intercede for us in our own challenging days and times and for all of the Christians throughout the world who are suffering persecution in one way or another. May he intercede for us and all of the martyrs so that we may be courageous too in our own day.